Hello. Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you here for the 2018 Francis Biddle Memorial Lecture and to welcome uh, Professor Cheryl Cashin, who will present the lecture, The Descendants from Slavery to Jim Crow to Dark Ghettos, A Call for 21st Century Abolition. Uh, as I am the only thing standing between you and hearing from Professor Cashin, I'll be brief. Uh, I'm going to say a few words about the history of this distinguished lecture series and a few words about our distinguished alumna who will be presenting this year's uh, lecture. Um, so first, as many of you know, uh, Francis Biddle, class of 1911, was Attorney General of the United States under President Franklin Roosevelt and served as the primary American judge during the post-war Nuremberg trials. His wife, Catherine Biddle, a distinguished poet and advocate of civil rights, endowed the Francis Biddle Memorial Lecture in 1972 in honor of her late husband. Uh, in the gift, uh, she specified, and I quote, uh, without limiting the subject matter, I hope that those selecting the individual lectures will keep in mind that civil liberties and civil rights were of particular concern to my husband and thus are in a particularly appropriate subject area for these lectures. We're very happy to welcome this year's Biddle lecturer, Cheryl Cashin, who's a professor of law at Georgetown University, where she teaches constitutional law and race and American law, among other subjects. And I just learned administrative law as well. Um, uh, Professor Cashin is also uh, vice chair of the board of the National Portrait Gallery and an active member of uh, the Poverty and Race Research Action Council. Uh, she graduated summa cum laude from Vanderbilt with a degree in electrical engineering. Uh, was a Marshall Scholar at Oxford where she studied English law and I am proud to say is an alumna of this law school. She was a law clerk to Judge Mikva and Justice Marshall and she served as an advisor on urban and economic policy uh, during the Clinton administration. Professor Cashin has written a number of influential books including uh, Place Not Race, which was nominated for an NAACP Image Award for Outstanding Nonfiction in 2015. The Failures of Integration, which was an editor's choice in the New York Times Book Review, and her most recent work, Loving, Interracial Intimacy in America and the Threat to White Supremacy. She is a two-time nominee for the Hurston Wright Legacy Award for Nonfiction. Uh, we are delighted to have her uh, deliver the Biddle Lecture. Uh, after she uh, delivers uh, the, the lecture, uh, my colleague and friend, uh, Professor Tomiko Brown-Nagan, uh, will uh, come up and uh, ask, uh, have a little, uh, a, a short dialogue, and if there's time remaining, uh, we'll uh, open the floor to questions. And so without further delay, I hope my, I kept my promise to keep this relatively brief, uh, and so without further delay, I'm very, very happy to welcome Professor Cheryl Cashin. Thank you so much. I can't tell you how honored I am to have been invited to deliver this lecture at my alma mater. Um, if I start identifying people from the audience, I'll get in trouble. Um, but thank you, Dean Manning, uh, Professor Brown Nagin, all of you. It's, uh, I will say it's fun to be among some of my cherry picked colleagues from Georgetown. Um, well, I, I'm going to dive in here. I'm going to tell you a story about American, America and the descendants of slavery. I will admit at the outset that I am a descendant of slaves and slave owners. Uh, I am also the daughter of civil rights activists who dedicated their lives to resisting white supremacy in all of its manifestations. As in all my work, this lecture is personal. As we approach the 400th anniversary of the arrival of slaves in what would become America, arrival of Africans in what would become America, this lecture reflects ideas I'm considering for my next book. In late August of 1619, John Rolfe, then former husband to Pocahontas and secretary of the Virginia colony, recorded that a Dutch man of war had arrived at Jamestown, and he wrote that it brought, quote, not anything but 20 and odd Negroes. These Negroes had names. 
Antonio, Isabel, Maria, Hero, Francisco, Margarita, John Pedro, Angelo. They were survivors, a small fraction of the 350 African prisoners who had been taken from Luanda, Angola four months before. This marked the beginning of a pattern for arrival of Africans to the colonies from Central West Africa. But throughout the 17th century, white bonded people provided by far most of the labor to produce tobacco. And as an aside, I focus uh, in this talk in, on Virginia initially because it was the most populous of the colonies and a leader in creating the legal framework for slavery. For the first six decades of the Virginia colony, black slaves shared a status similar to that of indentured white servants. That relative equality to white bonded people began to change, however, when the masters decided in the 1660s to transition from indentured white servitude to black chattel slavery as the main source of labor. But the masters had a problem. The white, black, and indigenous bonded people who had toiled alongside each other for six decades had a habit of alliance that needed to be broken. They would get drunk together, steal hogs together, sometimes have sex, marry, run off to the, live with the Indians, and uh, most problematically for the masters, they would rebel together occasionally against their masters. Whiteness was created to solve a class conflict between wealthy planters and poor white servants. It had a political function to divide and conquer, and this legacy of dog whistling continues to this day. Colonial plutocrats, those that could afford to own a body or a contract attached to one, began to create a color line by in elevating indentured whites with protections against harsh treatment and other benefits while stripping black slaves of privileges they had enjoyed. Down through the ages, plutocrats and political opportunists would teach each new generation of whites that you could not marry, have sex with, live near, play checkers with, much less a lie in politics with people of another race. This ideology of white supremacy justified regimes of oppression that were essential to American capitalism and expansion. Slavery, indigenous and Mexican conquest, exclusion of Asian and other immigrants, and later, Jim Crow. This lecture is about one persistent strain of American oppression. Of course, there are other strains, but today, I want to talk about the continuum of anti-black oppression. From slavery to Jim Crow to the iconic dark ghetto, to use Kenneth Clark's phrase, in particular, this lecture is by and for current denizens of ghettos. My friend, Harvard philosopher Tommy Shelby uses this phrase, de ghetto denizen, throughout his wonderful new book, Dark Ghettos, and I rather like it. Denizen, rhymes with citizen, well, sort of rhymes. <laughs> to begin, uh, here is an overview of my argument. We have a history of creating peculiar institutions to subordinate black people. And I will acknowledge that I'm greatly influenced by the work of Michelle Alexander and Reva Siegel in her article, Why Equal Protection No Longer Protects. I'm also greatly influenced by social dominance theory. According to social dominance theory, human societies tend to organize as group-based social hierarchies in which at least one group enjoys greater social status and power than other groups. Members of the dominant group will have greater access to material goods while subordinated groups are often forced to endure substandard housing, underemployment, dangerous and distasteful work, disproportionate punishment, stigma, and vilification. 
Throughout history, most societies have such hierarchies, and most countries have origin stories, or what scholars call hierarchy-enhancing myths. And these origin myths promote patterns of behavior that constitute culture and reify hierarchy-enhancing institutions. Once such institutions are in place, they tend to perpetuate themselves over generations. People operating within these institutions defend their discriminatory practices as part of defending the institution. Meanwhile, there are hierarchy attenuating myths and practices like abolitionism, civil and human rights. But once a hierarchical structure is in place, it becomes much easier to maintain inequality than to attenuate it. In America, we have the discomforting origin myth of the superiority of the white Christian European, embodied, for example, in the concept of manifest destiny. We also have the hierarchy attenuating mythology of America as a land of freedom and opportunity, and Thomas Jefferson embodies both ideas. He embodies America's incongruities. He authors the beautiful words of the Declaration of Independence and those self-evident truths of universal human equality have become a fundamental American value. He also writes in notes on the state of Virginia, he writes words that trade in white supremacy. Speculating aloud about the alleged inferiority of Africans to whites in ways that apologize for, if not justify, black slavery. And so it began. Masters created the peculiar American institution of black chattel slavery, which was horrifically brutal compared to other systems of servitude in the world. Excuse me. In so doing, the masters also created an American blackness that was defined heavily by the degradations of slavery. To be a slave, even a mulatto, light-skinned one, was to be functionally black, disempowered, and dehumanized. A racial dogma of black inferiority and white superiority became a central part of American culture. Each time reformers believed they had dismantled an institution that subordinated black people, supremacists created new subordinating structures and new stereotypes to justify them. Abolitionists thought they had ended slavery, then white supremacist Democrats in the states of the former Confederacy adopted the black codes, which legally re rendered it a crime to be black and free. Vaguely worded vagrancy laws provided the pretext for reestablishing control over black people, imprisoning them, and hiring them out for cheap labor. The radical Republicans in Congress responded by enacting the Civil Rights Act of 1866, the Military Re Reconstruction Act, and forcing the South to ratify the Reconstruction Amendments. Reconstruction was utterly radical. 700 men of color, including, I'm proud to say, my great-grandfather, served in the legislatures of the former Confederacy, along with whites loyal to the Union. Together, they created public education for the first time in the South and adopted constitutions and a vision for an integrated society. This literally drove some whites mad. Southern supremacists lost their minds when they lost control of black bodies. They created the myth of the black sexual predator as part of the dogma to destroy reconstruction and regain control. Fear-inducing stereotypes had not previously been pervasive, but they became pervasive in the two decades following emancipation. It made no sense, but black men voting and holding office was as provocative as the idea of them having sex with white women. This trope animated the passion play of American lynching. In this infamous movie, Birth of a Nation, you can see the association. In one scene, white men in blackface play the roles of black legislators as buffoons who put their feet on the desks and eat chicken in the halls of the legislature. And another scene, a black man, uh, a man 
in blackface chases after a white southern magnolia and she leaps to her death rather than be ravished by a black man. There's also, there was also an iterative relationship between stereotypes, law, and private action. A stereotype helped to justify each new institution. I put the word inferior up here under slave stereotype to, uh, uh, as a catch-all for an array of stereotypes of the gentle but inferior slave. Mammy, Uncle Tom, Piccaninny, Sambo. Uh, there were also some stereotypes of the dangerous but still inferior slave to justify harsh control of would-be Nat Turners. Um, legislatures, in turn, would pass laws to create or reify the institution, and these laws, in turn, help to teach and perpetuate anti-black discriminatory practices by the white public. Laws tended to conscript, as you see here, laws tended to conscript the white public into surveillance and policing of black bodies. Of course, in every era, Blacks did have some allies, and I feature some famous and non-famous radicals in my book, Loving. But generally, anyone who disagreed with the regime of oppression was also constrained by law and social custom from offering assistance to blacks or from crossing the color line. The habits of segregation, fear, loathing, disassociation, and discrimination, particularly of poor black people in large numbers, became embedded. The Supreme Court played a central role in this iterative process, with a few rare exceptions like Yik Wo, and Strauder v. West Virginia, for the first century and a half of its existence, the court largely acquiesced in the racism of the white public. Sometimes the court incorporated that racism into the logic of its opinion. Dred Scott, infamously in Dred Scott v. Sanford, even free blacks had no rights which the white man was bound to respect. More politely, in the civil rights cases in Plessy versus Ferguson, the court refused to enforce social equality for blacks, uh, of blacks, largely because whites did not want to sacrifice the privileges of dominance. And the 13th Amendment did not prevent Southern governments from instituting systems of convict labor convict labor that researchers have called slavery by another name. These systems would endure well into the 20th century. In much of the late 19th and early 20th century, the nadir, as some historians call it, the white public responded to blacks through strategies of violence and containment. By the 1920s, as hundreds of thousands of poor black former sharecroppers descended on northern American cities, economic competition, and white racism surged. Southern whites had the system of Jim Crow to subordinate blacks. Excuse me. As Gunnar Myrtle explained in his classic treatise, An American Dilemma, the regime of Jim Crow proliferated on the fear of black men having sex with white women. It was the central animating propaganda by it. If you're allowed to sit next to a white person, your daughter may end up having sex with a black man. Um, it was easy to use this ruse also to garner widespread support, uh, not only for segregation, but to incite lynching. Northern whites also resorted to violence and segregation Race riots broke out in three dozen cities in the red summer of 1919. In lieu of the southern regime of Jim Crow, northern whites created and relied on ghettos to contain blacks. The iconic dark ghetto, like slavery and Jim Crow, was not accidental. Government acted with great intention in segregating northern blacks, although multiple state actors contributed. This is uh, heavily, um, I, I talk about this a lot in my first book, The Failures of Integration. Among the many uh, state policies, the Supreme Court sanctioning Euclidean zo zoning, the Home Owners Lending Corporation and FHA, 
subsidizing white suburbanization and teaching redlining to lenders, the interstate highway program, urban renewal, federally sponsored public housing by design and location, uh, all of these things help to create the modern phenomenon of concentrated black poverty. The HOLC deserves special attention. The federal government decided in the 1930s that it was economically risky and not appropriate for people of different races to live together. It redlined cities, giving majority black neighborhoods a D rating, and that decision reverberated and became destiny. A recent Federal Reserve study looked at these neighborhoods uh, that had give, been given a D rating in the 30s, and to this day, a found effects of, of the D rating. It correlated with disinvestment and decline of what had been, in many cases, vibrant places. Um, I got this, the, the, this is the city of Louisville, and you can go on the city's website, and they actually have a map where they show neighborhoods and the ratings they got, and then you can compare the poverty and racial uh, characteristics of the neighborhood, and you can see um, some of these holdover effects. I, I draw a direct analogy to the colonist decision to construct whiteness and blackness. The ghetto, as a mechanism of separation and subordination, was born. As Massey and Denton point out in their seminal book, American Apartheid, rates of black segregation rose in every decade from the 1920s to the 1970s, and a new phenomenon of hypersegregation of blacks emerged. In other words, as Charles Hamilton Houston and Thurgood Marshall, and increasingly, I say, and Constance Baker Motley, among others, were chipping away at the planks of Southern Jim Crow, Northern whites were institutionalizing the black ghetto as much as possible. Most Northern blacks were severely constrained in their housing choices by state policy and private violence and discrimination. I'm gonna go back here. Um, as with the peculiar institutions of slavery and Jim Crow, the dark ghetto also helped to incubate and spread stereotypes about blackness. Much as candidate Tr Donald Trump associated the blacks with inner cities, which he called a disaster, education-wise, job-wise, safety-wise, in every way possible, northern whites in the 20th century made similar assumptions about black people. Well, the radicals kept fighting in the courts before taking to the streets, and this did disrupt Supreme, the Supreme Court's equal protection jurisprudence. In 1954, in the cases of Hernandez v. Texas and Brown v. Board, the Warren Court began to put pressure on whites to give up the racial order that had reified and insulated whiteness for three centuries. In Loving versus Virginia in 1967, for the first time in the court's history, the court named the ideology that the Civil War and the 14th Amendment was supposed to have ended. The court explicitly stated that Virginia's miscegenation law was designed to promote white supremacy, and this was part of the subtext for striking down all such laws. Perhaps Chief Justice Warren, writing for a unanimous court, thought being transparent about this pervasive race of racial dogma would help cure the nation of its mental illness. The long, hot summer of 1967 had already begun when the court issued its opinion on June 12th. Several cities had erupted before the opinion came down. By the end of 1967, 159 uprisings had roiled the United States, most lethally in Detroit, where a police raid on an after-hours bar set off a five-day revolt that ended in 43 deaths and 2,000 injuries. President Johnson created the Kerner Commission to understand the source of these urban uprisings and make recommendations. Uh, I'm reminded a few days, uh, a few weeks ago, in my uh, race in American law class, I asked students, had they heard of the Kerner Commission? And many of them hadn't. Um, 
which was surprising to me. But today, literally today, marks the 50th anniversary of the commission's report. And every few years, we still experience uprisings, most recently in Ferguson, St. Louis, and Baltimore, largely for the same reasons identified in 1968. A people segregated into low opportunity, high poverty neighborhoods rebelled when harassed or killed by the police. They were tired of being tired and rose up. The Kerner Commission blamed white racism. In particular, it stated, and I quote, white society is deeply implicated in the ghetto. When it, white institutions created it, white institutions maintain it, and white society condones it. The commission recommended full incorporation of the Negro into American society, what Reconstruction tried to do. Specifically, it called on the nation to end residential segregation and dismantle the dark ghetto. The civil rights movement did dismantle some of the architecture of su supremacy, ending de jure segregation in public accommodations, hopefully in voting, and employment. Certainly, the movement created a black middle class. In 1950, nearly three quarters of African Americans lived below the poverty line. Today, three quarters of black people are not classified as poor. But the key feature of the supremacist regime that has never been dismantled is the dark ghetto. What happens in a society in which income, wealth, and opportunity are increasingly concentrated in certain neighborhoods and poverty and disinvestment are concentrated elsewhere? Douglas Massey invokes Charles Tilley's phraseology and calls it opportunity hoarding. Massey argues that where social boundaries conform to geographic ones, the processes of social stratification that come naturally to human beings become much more efficient and effective. I'm gonna repeat that. Where social boundaries conform to geographic ones, the processes of social stratification that come naturally to human beings become much more efficient and effective. This brings me to my key point what I hope to say in a future book. There is a rich literature on the construction and the role of modern stereotypes of blackness in justifying what amounts to criminalization of blackness. My colleague Paul Butler, who's in the room, explores this in detail in his latest book, Chokehold. Less explored is the role of the ghetto itself in incubating these stereotypes. To use the vocabulary of the academy, the ghetto has not been theorized. I believe the iconic ghetto is the primary institution for containment and othering of dark people whom society currently perceives as unworthy of incorporation. To paraphrase sociologist Elijah Anderson, America's, American society is very invested in the ghetto as this dangerous place where people at the bottom of the social order live. The ghetto as an institution explains a dimension of othering that can't be explained solely by blackness. Our words and our mechanisms of subordination have changed. The problem of black belonging continues, but it is most felt by the ghetto denizen. The denizens, or the descendants, as I also like to call them, are the group least likely in American society to experience acceptance from people who live elsewhere. They are the group least likely to experience the accoutrements of citizenship. For them, there's a sense in which neither Dred Scott nor Plessy have been overturned. The ghetto by design is a place where exit is improbable, except to go to prison, which some analogize as a judicial substitute for the confines of the ghetto. As Patrick Sharkey's book, Stuck in Place, makes clear, over 70% of African Americans who live in today's poorest neighborhoods are from the same families that lived in ghettos in the 1970s. Among the state actions 
designed to contain denizens are the war on drugs, aggressive and militaristic policing in which blackness itself becomes the pretext for stopping people, the criminalization of poverty, and housing and school policies which encourage rather than discourage poverty concentration. Much as the institutions of slavery and Jim Crow conferred unearned material benefits, particularly on wealthy whites, the ghetto facilitates poverty-free, overwhelmingly white spaces. I live in Washington, D.C., and uh, in Washington, D.C., there are two public elementary schools within one mile of each other. One has 11% poverty, and the other has 99% poverty. And I don't even have to tell you which one of them is overwhelmingly black. You know the answer to that. And that is precisely, that arrangement precisely reflects our nation's long history of creating and protecting majority white space in part by concentrating black poverty elsewhere. As with slavery, as with Jim Crow, we tell ourselves stories to justify these arrangements. The dominant narrative is one of blame, focusing on individual responsibility rather than the systemic state and private actions that contain and subordinate the denizen. Apologists have constructed many modern stereotypes to support these narratives. The thug, welfare queen, welfare chief, lazy, somehow polluted people, the breakdown of the black family, and other rationalizations to justify isolation and fear. The idea that the denizens belong apart from everyone else is the unspoken and sometimes shouted out loud norm animating most fair housing and school segregation, desegregation debates. Among the private action engendered by these stereotypes are discrimination and avoidance of denizens in employment, schools, housing, along with private surveillance, particularly in gentrifying areas where affluent in migrants are moving to poor black neighborhoods. I taught a seminar, uh, a writing seminar, last semester in which 17 students were writing about some aspect of segregation, and some of their papers blew me away. A paper about the uh, ostensibly liberal techies in San Francisco using the 311 lines and police calls and monitoring and surveilling uh, on, uh, through apps and uh, websites the people of color in the neighborhoods that they were moving into. Uh, nuisance laws passed and disproportionately enforced, enforced against black low-income movers to white suburbs, those who had a miracle of getting a housing voucher, moving ostensibly to freedom, experiencing, uh, again, the surveilling of them uh, by private people and through state action. Meanwhile, only a relatively small number of census tracts might be called a ghetto in this country. Demographers use a threshold of 40% poverty to define concentrated poverty, and the number of these census tracts was about 3,800 in 2014. But less than 30% of those census tracts are majority African American, or predominantly African American, I should say. Concentrated poverty is by no means solely a black phenomenon in this, in this country, but the ghetto as a stereotype hides this fact. Researchers who actually look at the conditions of poor black neighborhoods find that there's a lot of complexity among them and among the people who live there. They suggest, these researchers suggest, that too many people have been watching shows like The Wire and that conceptions of the iconic ghetto, boarded up housing, vacant lots, isolated, depopulated places with few public and private amenities, amenities and much gang violence, they suggest that this, the conceptions like this apply to only nine zip codes in the entire United States. In other words, the ghetto as a cultural conception says a lot more about the people who live elsewhere than the denizens themselves. Again, this stereotype of the ghetto has a political, fun a political function, as did anti-black stereotypes of earlier eras. But the stereotype works. 
to maintain policies and practices of separation, and things are not getting better for the denizens. The footprint of concentrated poverty is expanding, and the percentage of blacks, Hispanics, and whites who live in such conditions are rising. As of 2014, 5 million blacks and 4.3 million Hispanics lived in ghettos or barrios. Meanwhile, concentrated poverty is growing fastest in the suburbs. One in 13 of the white poor now live in extremely impoverished places compared to one in four of the black poor and one in six of the Hispanic poor. But I want to show you some maps very quickly. Um, the, uh, these maps I'm going to show you show that um, the footprint of concentrated poverty is expanding and shifting as is the defining of uh, affluent predominantly white space. If you look at, uh, if you look at, uh, this is Pittsburgh in 2000 versus Pittsburgh in 2013. Now imagine if Pittsburgh had had, had drawn a tendance zone in schools, there's a possibility with people living among each other to have integrated um, schools without concentrated poverty. But look what's happened. That you basically have cleared out all the poor folks and concentrated them in a few places. And you could see this pattern in some other places. You look at, look at uh, Philadelphia in 2000, and now you, know, you have this nice uh, cleared out space. And you can even like, look, look at some particular census tracts. This is where a lot of uh, uh, gentrifying people have discovered these neighborhoods that had a D rating. They're cheaper. Um, and we have public policies that are pushing other people elsewhere. And the, again, the footprint of concentrated poverty, the dark places, are, is spreading. Um, and I, I show you a similar pattern um, in other places, even in Dallas, where you have that inclusive communities uh, project working really, really hard to scatter, um, uh, you know, to, to give people opportunity to live in high opportunity places. The footprint, you know, there's a dominant narrative of this is the bad place to live and everybody else should avoid. And, you know, I could tell that story in other places. Um, Atlanta, I'm just tr showing, put that in there to show how the footprint is going. Um, we, we are not um, um, pursuing the right policies, but I should say, it's not just white people who are engaged in the othering of people who live in concentrated poverty. Sometimes middle and upper class black people are participating in it. Even in Washington, D.C., where I live, where Democrats outnumber Republicans by 12 to 1 and where African Americans for many years controlled government, political leaders pursued punitive laws that fueled mass incarceration, filled the prisons, and this is what James Foreman's uh, great new book, Locking Up Our Own, is about. That same black political leadership was slow to adopt inclusionary zoning ordinances and pursued policies that displaced the poor. Well, the history of state action and resulting harms to ghetto denizens and American society forms the foundation for a movement for abolition. In the time I have remaining, I'm going to offer three normative arguments for abolition, although these arguments aren't exhaustive. I prefer to lead with the less obvious argument about the need to abolish the ghetto in order to repair a broken nation. At bottom, the dark ghetto facilitates a curated, palatable diversity that liberals can live with without while virtually you know, ensuring, particularly that whites, are never forced to practice the kind of robust pluralism necessary to humanizing poor black people and destroying white supremacy. I'd like to, you to consider a thought experiment. Consider how different our nation would be if we did not have any ghettos, if we hadn't intentionally created them. Perhaps you can imagine the wider range of choices people of all classes and races might have for schools and neighborhoods. Blackness would be less likely to be associated consciously or unconsciously with hysterical negatives. P policies and preferences of avoidance might be less common. Above all, poor black people might be seen as three-dimensional human beings. To summarize my first normative claim, 
The dark ghetto is a vestige of white supremacy. It must be abolished if we are to reconstruct a nation not built on that founding idea. My argument is that the state is obligated to repair the damage it has done in creating hypersegregation. The federal government in particular is obligated to affirmatively further integration, to choose different policies that confront, break up, dismantle segregation. Now, the denizens of ghettos deserve voice and agency in defining what emancipation would look like for their communities and themselves. I'm not here to prescribe for them, although I'm happy to talk about policy choices uh, during the Q&A. My second normative argument for abolishing the ghetto is that, that it's necessary for achieving the values of the 14th Amendment. If we really mean what we say, we stand for. Um, citizenship requires inclusion. The logic of Brown was right. Separate is inherently unequal in a, in a winner-take-all society that hoards opportunity in certain places and disinvests elsewhere. Brown didn't become wrong simply because so many people have resisted its requirements. And you know, I could, I could spend time talking about how segregation is deeply implicated in the inequality that denizens experience. Um, but in the interest of time, um, I'm going to move to my third and final nor normative argument. Abolition is necessary to improve possibilities for a better, saner politics. Segregation makes it much easier to sell racial dogma about outgroups. I, I think we need a 21st century abolition movement, not just for the descendants, but to emancipate ourselves from the ideology of supremacy. Black people's aspirations have always been inextricably bound with realizing these founding ideals. Now, the maps I showed suggest how hard this work is going to be. I admit it's hard. It's perhaps as hard as the first abolition movement or the civil rights movement. Um, given the enduring effectiveness of di divide and conquer, dog whistling politics, I don't have a whole lot of hope of creating um, some unity among struggling people of all colors. I am, however, optimistic about the possibilities for creating ascending coalitions of what I call culturally dexterous whites and progressive people of color who can fight together for abolitionist policies and frankly, just common sense. Um, I'll try to leave you with some hope. I know this has been a depressing talk, right? I think the old white black binary is no longer apt for describing where we are with race relations. I prefer to say that the main fulcrum of division in this country is between the dexterous and the non dexterous. And as I explained in the final chapter of my book, Loving, cultural dexterity is spreading. What is that? It's, it's frankly just the acceptance of difference. It's the opposite of colorblindness. It's the acceptance of difference rather than demanding that someone assimilate to your norms. And I predict a tipping point when a critical mass of whites, not a majority, um, acquires dexterity. And it involves the, the a convergence of a lot of trends, including, frankly, the dying off of older generations of whites who grew up expecting to be dominant. Um, <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, I'm going to leave you with cause for hope. The denizens and black folk generally have more allies than they might imagine. 60% of white millennials, for example, agree with the Black Lives Matter movement and its critique of law enforcement. Their grandparents, not so much. I'm heartened that the black millennials leading this movement reject respectability politics and embrace the denizen as worthy of agency, full citizenship, and protection. My hope and prayer is that as more of us acquire dexterity and habits of, of inclusion, America will too. Thank you. <laughs>
much, uh, Professor Cashin, for that provocative and timely lecture, Theorizing the Ghetto. I'm sure that uh, many people will have questions. I thought that I would start off our conversation um, by asking a set of questions about what to do in the run-up to abolition. Um, in particular, you mean 21st century abolition, yes, right? Yes, yes. Well, yes. Uh, I want to give you the opportunity to talk about some of the policy solutions that you think might be um, uh, available to those who are interested in this project that you identify. And I also want you to speak to um, a question that's more theoretical. You offered a set of normative arguments um, that will appeal to millennials who you expect to rise up. Um, what kinds of arguments can you marshal um, for those who uh, may not be so open to this project, um, but perhaps could be incentivized to be open to it? Um, and I think about economic arguments, even arguments from uh, security, um, that is the social disorder um, and uh, division actually threaten the country. So I wonder what you would think about, one, the second set of arguments that I put on the table, and two, just talk about policy. Okay, so um, common sense solutions actually cost the taxpayer less. Mm. And I, I think if you look at the consensus that had emerged before uh, Jeff Sessions became the Attorney General, uh, there was a, a consensus was emerging on the right and the left, and in a lot of red states, that uh, the war on drugs was a costly mistake, right? And um, so you know, a lot of the ideas that I've thought about in terms of what emancipation would look like, um, it costs a lot less to uh, incarcerate less, uh, police less, invest less in policing, and invest in uh, community programs and schools. Um, it costs a lot less to uh, integration. When it's achieved, it actually works. It, it works uh, uh, miraculously in terms of raising uh, achievement, reducing prejudice, mm -hmm. creating a, 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 a civic context in which people want to invest in their schools. Um, and there are you know, what I call small utopias now, mm -hmm. where you can, you, you can see um, how different certain communities feel when they've pursued policies like you know, magnet schools, inclusionary zoning, um, uh, deconcentrating poverty or, or not, not having it in, in the first place. Um, and what, what, I, what I try to say in my writing and my talks is that um, when we achieve these integrated spaces without, or, or, or just sticking with the abolition argument, if you don't have concentrated poverty, both the, 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 the willing, privileged person can live in a very diverse society without fear, mm -hmm. can engage more you know, and, and return to the public square. And meanwhile, uh, the denizen has much more of a possibility of accessing opportunity um, in a way where they get to fulfill their dreams and you know the state doesn't have to invest so much in all the infrastructure of containment. So um, those are some of the arguments I would make. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I want to get some more questions on the table. I'm sure there are those in the audience who have questions for you. Yes. Do you want to come up to the microphone? Can you hear yes? <laughs> Thank you so much for this talk. Um, I have a particular question. You talked about the role of institutions in preserving uh, hierarchies on the basis of race or economic status. Uh, I wanted to ask what role do elite education institutions like Harvard, Harvard Law have in perpetuating <laughs> systems of oppression um, that further segregate black and brown communities economically, politically, and socially? That's the first part. The second part, what role do these institutions have to repair the harms that they've caused and profited from? Ooh, that's a loaded question. Um, so I, 
the main thing elite universities do is block out people from high poverty places of all colors, right? But the, the, the pipelines to these places are, are not wide. Um, I, I've said this in print, you know, um, places like Harvard, they, they, they were, they're complicit in and participating in segregation um, in this, and, and a lot of the practices that we call screening for merit is actually screening for advantage, for built-in advantages, right? Um, and yeah, fortunately, and I'm not up, up, up to date on how admissions are going here, so I can't critique Harvard Law School particularly on this, but fortunately, a, a lot of, there's a sort of counter movement developing um, in selective undergraduate um, education where you know, some universities are really, really doing things differently to bring people who are high achieving people who can do the work from disadvantaged places um, and understanding how to do that, right? So that's one way to participate. I can't, you know, I, I think in the interest of time, I'll stop there. And maybe you can talk after mm -hmm. the session. I think I want to bring Dean Manning back up uh, to uh, thank uh, Professor Cashin for her talk. Thank you. Professor Cashin, thank you so much for being here, for giving a wonderful little lecture. Uh, and we would like to uh, give you, as a small token of our gratitude, thank uh, you so much. a framed poster to thank commemorate you. the event. I appreciate that. Thank you that so, so much. much. It was thank you. Wonderful. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.